Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Huddle and Flow podcast brought to you by Intuit, proud makers of TurboTax, Mint, and QuickBooks. I am Steve White with my guy, Jim Trotter, two-thirds of the Howard University mob. Thomas Warren back on the ones and twos, completing the puzzle, HU mob. And Jim, real interesting week now. We're kind of a few weeks removed from the Super Bowl. We're edging towards free agency. We're hearing stuff about... Uh, the salary cap coming down and this and that. But to me, the, the, the bigger story uh, coming into this week and coming off of this weekend it w- was more of a human one involving Cam Newton. And, you know, we're, we're kind of old heads. You know, we're we're in our 50s. We have a certain way, the way we raise and deal with stuff. But, we you know, people have seen the viral video of a young man, a uh, football player participating in a seven-on-seven tournament that Cam – help sponsor he's got teams in the seven on seven group and this young man was barking at cam you're a free agent you're about to be poor you ain't this and that this and that and then cam coming back and engaging the kid at first off people thought he was trolling the kid like who are you what have you done this and that where's your dad but cam was saying hey where's your dad i want to have a man-to-man conversation with him and this and that but this was this was a moment i think where i was kind of like ho 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 young fella not just that Cam is an NFL player and a former MVP and is given his time. You don't speak to anybody, let alone an adult, the way you spoke to him. And I just want to kind of yeah, get your man. thoughts on this because it, en- it ended up being a very good teaching moment. No, and, and that's what I took away from it first and foremost. The first thing is when I heard the, the, the teenager speaking like that, I was like, man, um, where are the adults in this? Where's the coach in this? Where's the father in this? You know, you just don't do that. Um, that's the way we were raised. You don't speak to adults like that. I mean, when you address um, your elders, it's always Mr. This or Miss That or Mrs. That. You know, there's a, there's a respect factor. So that was first and foremost. I thought that that uh, the kid was wrong. Um, but I thought Cam, for those who don't know him and haven't seen him in environments like this, I truly believe that that is how he viewed it as a teachable moment. And he was not going to get into a barking match with this kid. Um, and I and I was happy to see that, you know, truthfully, uh, because he didn't throw this kid away because he very easily could have said, get out. You know, it's my tournament and it's a seven on seven tournament that he puts um, together. I, I was actually at one some years ago. Uh, it was actually after his rookie season. I went down to Atlanta and attended one of his seven on seven camps. And he takes his role seriously as being sort of a role model for these guys and being a a mentor now, even as he's gotten older. So I very much believe that, that he was all about this teachable moment. And what did we see this morning or Monday morning? We saw the kid put out an an apology, a statement apologizing. Now, I don't know who spoke to him about it, um, but whoever did props to them because this should have been done right away. Um, but to Cam, I say, I don't know that he could have handled that much better um, in terms of how he did. And so I just want to give him major props for that because that could have gotten ugly really quickly. You know, you just don't disrespect anyone like that, let alone, um, you know, and, and when I say disrespect him, I mean, also coming into his house, because that's essentially what it was, it's Cam's house. You were coming into Cam's house and you were going to disrespect him like that? That's a hard one. So I give Cam a lot of credit for being um, the man that we would all hope to be in that situation and and create a teachable moment. And I think hopefully he got through to this kid. Well, you know, look, speaking of teachable moments, in just a few minutes we're going to bring on Kelvin Beecham, uh, a veteran offensive lineman who last season played with the Arizona Cardinals. And we're going to get into a lot of his teachable moments. He's he's working with the Players Coalition to really bridge the digital divide issues. And, and, and Kelvin's been front and center for years on a lot of these education-based matters. But I think, what, you know, to get back to Cam, I think he also realized he had dozens of young men right there, right? And if he had flipped out on this kid, like a lot of people, you know, the, the first thing you see on Twitter is Cam should have whipped this kid's ass, you know, this and that. No, that's not what you do because he's got a lot of young, impressionable people right there. And again, let's take the celebrity aspect out of it. He's a grown man, right? So he said, and he's a, and he was, and these are mainly black kids. And he was saying, look, 
I'm going to engage this kid and I'm going to talk to him about him. If you watch the longer part of the video, hey, when did you play today? How did you guys do? Um, what did you do in those games? How much do you lift? You know, and some people are kind of like, hey, maybe Cam's mocking him because he's a pro athlete. And, you know, this kid, maybe he didn't succeed. No, he was engaging this young man to find out about him, to find out maybe why this kid popped off on him the way he did. And the young man's name is J. Seth Owens. At least that's on his Twitter handle. And some reports are saying yeah, that's his name, J. Seth Owens. He's from Pennsylvania. And in his apology, he said, look, my parents did not raise me to speak to people like that. So hopefully his parents would have done what you and I would have done if our children ever came out of pocket like that to an adult. And said, don't you ever do that again because you're carrying our name and our legacy and you just don't treat adults like that. And, 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 and you know, that's how we would have been handled after my mother would have said, go pick your own switch because you're getting some of this as well. But yes, sir. You know, again, I think this is a, it was it was just as you said, Jim. Cam might not have been able to handle this any better. And, I, and I'm glad that this went viral on social media because a lot of people were saying, hey, this is what you get. This kid is the, from the troll social media world. But I took out of it, again, maybe it's because I'm a middle-aged man. Hey, Cam showed us what, what grace and maturity should look like under circumstances like this, which where he really could have gone a lot of different ways. Couldn't agree with you more. Um... I think Cam gets a bad rap in a lot in a, in a lot of ways. People focus on how he dresses and all of those other silly things. And at the end of the day, it's not about any of that. It's about who you are. It's about your character. And the one thing I know about Cam, when you talk to people um, who have played with him, particularly later in his career, you know, when he came in, he had some learning to do in terms of how to handle certain situations, the impact of being a leader and having to focus on you all the time. But he works hard cares about his teammates and in that situation he cared about that young man so major props to cam and um and again i hope those other other students learn from it as well but it wasn't just a teaching moment for those young young folk either steve i really believe it was a teachable moment for that coach or the coaches of that team because i'm still floored that they allowed this to happen you know and that they didn't address he or they didn't address it right there and say, that is not what we are about, you know? So to the adult, I say that was a teachable moment for him too, because that never should have been allowed to happen. No, absolutely not. Well, it sounds like Jay Seth Owens, hopefully he learned his lesson um, and, and can teach other people about that. Like, hey, I did this. It's not a cool thing to do. But Jim, let's move on to our special guest, Calvin Beach. Um, who, again, has been for, for years has really stepped up in the education. You know him from your work that you've done on the Players Coalition. He's worked with Anquan Bolden and so many of the great leaders. Um, you know, and, and some of the work that he's doing, you know, really focusing on the digital divide, which has come to light more than ever because of COVID and people having to learn and work uh, and everything remotely. So, Jim, let's go ahead and bring in our special guest, guest Kelvin. Um, where he can discuss some of the work that him and the Players Coalition are doing. All right, Jim, now we're joined by our special guest, Kelvin Beecham. He's a free agent right now, but he was with the Arizona Cardinals last season. He's been in the NFL for a while. Kelvin, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, fellas. This is an honor. No, it's our honor, big fella. Yeah, we we really appreciate you know. Besides being a, a you know heck of a football player, the stuff the stuff you're doing in the community and with the players' coalition and on your own with your foundation is one of the main reasons um, that we want you know we wanted to have you on the show to talk about all the work being done. But before we get there, let's get to some real life stuff here, Kelvin. Um, your family is from Texas, and we saw the winter storms and all of the people who are really struggling because the power outages and the water situation is everybody down there good that, that you know your family members and everything you know they're doing better um i would say wednesday thursday was was pretty rough uh you know people in the country where i'm from uh, mahia texas i'm about 7500 people they know how to survive uh but if you take what they need for survival away for almost a week you know things start to get a little dicey you know, had a couple family members, uh, extended family that moved in with my, my parents. You know, they're out in the country. They got a septic tank. Uh, they got a chimney. So they, they're able to, to kind of use 
use a little different means, you know, kind of off the grid a little bit to be able to use different means, but they found a way to make it through. You know, right now we're just struggling with our grandmother trying to get her, uh, her water back on. Uh, the water main broke outside of her house, so she can't even get water into the house. Uh, so trying to get that taken care of. And you know, for you know, for old folks, man, they, it's the simple things in life that they care most about. So she's like, baby, I can't flush the toilet. And that's mm-hmm. all I need to be able to do. So, you know, simple things like that. But, you know, I think, you know, if 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 nothing else, I think this has really taught people what it's like to, to experience real pro- poverty, um, especially for those in Texas. Um, if you've never experienced, if you've never been a part of it, this is just a taste of what it's like to not have access to drinking water, have access to, to running water, having access to power. Um, and you think about what the what Players Coalition has done and what a number of guys have done. They've tried to, to, to give a voice to those who don't have and, and those who don't have access. So this is just a, a real time, real life. I mean, everything is real life, but I mean, just the, everybody is seeing exactly what's going on. Um, and, and you see just the disparities and, and just how communities can be marginalized. That's the thing that got me most is where you see certain communities where, for instance, the power is on Mm -hmm. and other communities where the power is not on. And you say, what's the difference? And it's so transparent. And then from the water standpoint, as I watch what was happening in Texas, all I kept thinking about was Flint, Yeah, you know, and the folks up in Flint. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and to this point, no one has been prosecuted for that, which which blows my mind. Yeah. Um, But yeah, no. So. You know, our prayers are out for all for everyone who's been affected, and hopefully, you know, we get this thing um, addressed soon. Yeah, we hope so. Going on that, you know, you you talked about how Mother Nature highlighted some of the disparities, right? Mm-hmm. Well, this is something you've really been, you know, embroiled in. I mean, COVID really brought a lot of a lot of that to reality for a lot of people. Yeah. A, a lot of things, but one that you've you've been a, a part of with the Players Coalition again, you independently and other people, the digital divide. Mm-hmm. Um, explain why that was so important to you and so many other people to address, because that's something a lot of folks never even thought about before people had to learn, work, and be educated remotely. Yeah, you know, I think when you when you put it in the most simplest forms, you know, Jim just said it best: is it's those who have access and those who don't. And when COVID, you know, the height of COVID, we're still in COVID right now. When you think about what was going on when you were trying to get people to have remote learning and remote work to be something that was a, a daily, um, you know, a, a daily portion of life, that's not the case for some people in, in America. And you have those who have access to internet, access to Wi-Fi, access to hotspots. You have those who don't. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. I think, you know, we've known about some of these issues. We've known about you know, hey, if you're in the hood, you may not have great access to the internet. If you're in a, you know, a housing development, you know, for me, if you're in the country, you know, you just may not have a signal if you walk outside your house, as simple as that. So to realize that now education is put forth at the forefront because you're pulling kids out of school, well, how do you make sure that these same young people have access to be able to learn just like everybody else in the country? Um, and, and, you know, have been privy to have conversations with people across the country, Texas, People in Indianapolis, people in Atlanta, people in Chicago and L.A. and, you know, Seattle and, and, and New York, you know, all over the country. And they talk about just some of these the very simple issues. If you're on one side of the tracks, you got access to the Internet. You're in one little silo of the community. You have access to Internet. And if you're not, you you up the creek, you know, um, and, and it's, it's been a lot of patchwork. And I would say even us, we've we've just continued to work on symptoms. But right now we're trying to get to the to the the root cause and some of the root issues, and we know that that takes a village. It takes, you know, us as athletes being able to lend our voice and lend our time and energy to some of these things. But it also takes the private sector playing a role. It takes the government playing a role, both on the federal, state, and local level. I mean, it takes all of us. And I hate to use that term because uh, the NFL used that quite a bit this year. But you know, at the end of the day, it, it really takes. A, a number of people wanting to be collaborative to, to work towards this common goal or just making sure that there's equality within America, there's equality within education, and there's equality within making sure that people have access to, to the internet. You know, Kelvin, from my standpoint, one of the things that concerns me most about the digital divide is I fear that we may be losing a generation no. because of, of, of the lack of equity here. And I think back to it in our day, paper and pencil was so important. You know, Mm -hmm. when I went to school, obviously Steve and I are a little older than you, but 
paper and pencil was 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 the fundamentals, the basics of what you mm -hmm. needed. Broadband now is to me is paper and pencil for this generation. Mm -hmm. And for these students not to have that, how concerned are you that potentially we could be losing a generation with this situation? Very concerned. You know, I consider this a public utility. You know, it's it's a basic I hate to put it in this term, but I feel it's a basic human right to be able to have access to great broadband internet. And I would say we're losing three years, in my in my estimation, of students due to COVID and, and, and how the digital divide has been um, exacerbated. You think about 2020, think about 2021, we're trying to execute getting this vaccine out to everybody. And then 2020, you know, 2022, are we really going to have things back to normal? So we have these young people being able to do not only the basic things of, of making sure they can go to school, learn, but can they go home and be able to learn? And can they take part in extracurricular activities that are some of those things that produce the well-roundedness that we need for our students to go and succeed within the global economy? So I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think we're, we are going to be losing some within this generation, um, especially this, this three-year gap that we're having right now, just because of how extensive um, and how wide ranging this particular issue is. Can you know, we do, go, oh, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Well, well I'm gonna dig a little say, deeper since, since we're on this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Talk go about ahead, that. no, you're good. You know, so, so you said you're talking about the symptoms. Okay, so we're talking about maybe the lack of access to Wi-Fi. But yeah. what? let's get to the human element of this as well. Because, you know, in some cases we have parents who are out at work now you have children who are trying to be taught by maybe grandparents or an aunt or an older sibling. Maybe they don't speak the language that well. Um, and now you have teachers trying to communicate to a group instead of individually. I mean, so even if they've got some of this access, you know, again, you're talking about addressing some of the symptoms. Yeah. Is this something that that is being addressed. I mean, and, and how can there be a solution? Because it really seems, again, the human element of this is, is just so multi-tiered and complex. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very multi-tiered. It's very complex because there's an element that I don't think people talk about enough is the digital literacy that's actually needed to be able to operate with how fast technology is changing and how fast learning is changing. You know, I think about how I used to go to school and I'm not old by any means, but I think about how I used to go to school and how my daughter is currently having to go to school in kindergarten when, she, when they were having to do things online and virtually. It's completely different. You have, you know, kindergartners having to use five and six different platforms to be able to submit work and do work and, you know, having to watch videos on YouTube and Loom and all these different pieces of technology. It's, it's a di digital literacy component or the human element of how can you make sure this young person can, can learn? Can you provide an opportunity for this grandparent to learn because you know that their parents are at work or if their parents are at home, how are they able to multitask of making sure that they can provide for their kids as far as making sure that they're doing what they need to be able to work or can they work from home? Do they have the means to work from home? And can they be able to also help their kids if their kids are having to work from home as well? And then that stress, stresses the infrastructure or the broadband within that home because can there be five or six computers, you know, or laptops or smartphones, what have you, being able to work all from that one hotspot? So it's it's a number of different layers and a number of different ways in which you know this is complex. And you know, to say that I know the actual solution, I, I can't say that I know that yet. But what I am doing and what I can say the Players Coalition is trying to do, and some of the partners that I've worked with, you know, I think about into it. That I've tried that I've worked with, they're working through solutions that are one measurable, because I think we do have to find a way to measure this, and then finding ways to hit everybody within the ecosystem, the teachers, the students, the parents, and 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 being able to bring you know all these these silos together and try to move you know the ball forward as best we can. You know, let's put a little meat on the ball so people actually understand some of the numbers here. So in doing some research on this. You know, the Pew Research Center did a poll um, mm -hmm. roughly a year ago in early April of 2020. And what it found is that roughly one in five parents with homebound school aged children say it's very likely or somewhat likely their children will not be able to complete their schoolwork because they don't have access to a computer. 
So we're talking roughly 21%, almost a quarter of those who were polled. And then if you go on and you look at, at, at further details in that study, it said nearly half of all parents with lower incomes say it is very likely or somewhat likely their children will have to do schoolwork on a cell phone. So we're talking almost half of those folks. For me, just trying to do some research on a cell phone at times is a struggle. So imagine now these kids who are trying to, to get the foundation of an education mm -hmm. to go on and be productive in society and whatnot. I wonder, Kelvin, from your standpoint, what are you hearing in terms of, of the work that you're doing um, that can best address this solution? How do we get past this? Because one of the things to me, it's not just offering broadband or internet access. Mm -hmm. Number one, what's the speed of that, that, that internet mm -hmm. access? Because if it's dropping consistently and you're trying to do your homework, that doesn't work. Um, and as you say, if you're using multiple platforms or there are multiple computers on that one hotspot, now you've got a problem. Even us with this podcast at times, we have internet breakdown. So, <laughs> so what are you hearing is, is, is the solution to, to, yeah. to this? You know, I said the word earlier, but it's, it's the concept of making this a public utility. Like this has to be a part of the fabric of America now that you have high speed internet. Um, I think about one of the solutions that we've been working with out in West Texas, where you know they're talking about shooting internet down from, from space right now, you know, and, and utilizing what, what Tesla is doing. And here's the thing, man, we just put uh, a contraption, a robot on Mars <laughs> a couple of days ago. So it ain't like we stupid, right? It ain't like we can't figure it out. There are ways and there are means to put uh, a robot on or a piece of technology on Mars and have it circulate on Mars for, for weeks at a time. We can figure out how to, to make sure that we can solve this problem. Um, it's about so prioritizing. Are, you know, again, I, I, you know, we were talking about this on, on backstage. I was, I was watching, um, you know, the, the MLK FBI documentary uh, on Amazon Prime and, you know, one of Dr. King's speeches that he got a lot of slack for was he talked about Vietnam and how, you know, the nation's priorities were mixed up. You know, we're working about fighting communism and uh, in, in, in Vietnam, we got poverty right right here, you know, a war with poverty right here, you know, that we see every single day. And I would say the same thing right now. We're worried about winning a space war with whoever we're talking about. We're starting a space agency, but we can't find a way to make sure that people have access to the Internet. So it's I feel it is priorities. And if we put the focus on this priority. And it's not just a, a black thing. And I think that's that's one thing that I want to make sure that I reiterate. It is, it's not a black thing or it's only black people that don't have access to internet. Man, you go into the hills of West Virginia. They got the same thing going on. You go into to West Texas. There ain't a lot of black folks in West Texas. But, you know, you're finding ways to, to, to hit people who don't have access to some of these, these means. So it's not a white or black thing. It's, it's, it's a people thing. And when you turn it into a people thing, I feel you can get the right people behind it and the right uh, funds behind it. But it, it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, we can put something on Mars, but we can't find a way to make sure that people in the hood got internet. Yeah, I think that's so important what you said, because to me, the work that the Players Coalition does at its very core has always been about people, mm -hmm. not necessarily about race and whatnot, but these are human issues, Correct. not just black, white issue and whatnot. So that's why I appreciate the work that you do, that the Players Coalition does and that others are doing, you know, to try and correct this because poverty doesn't know color. Yeah. You know, poverty crosses all lines. So I, I'm with you 100 percent on that. I, I just I'm just, I, you know, look, my kids are grown, but I, I really feel concerned about what's coming behind us in terms of this generation and how we are putting people, young kids behind. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like starting a hundred yard race and someone else has a 50 yard head start. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just not right. Um, so again, I, I appreciate the work you're doing. I know Steve has a question there, but I, I had to get on my soapbox for a minute. No, I, no, I, no, I, I love it because look, part of this too is, I mean, school systems are in a situation like, do we, do we hold the student back because he or she doesn't, hasn't done enough to, to be advanced or do we just pass them through because that's the time we're in. And I think, you know, and speaking to educators, they're saying we're, we're passing them through. We can't fail any children right now. It's not their fault. So now we're going to be putting people into the real world who aren't equipped. And, you know, you're just hoping at some point um, we can play the, you know, the catch up game. 
Um, but to kind of change gears a little bit, Kelvin, one thing we had Anquan Bolden on um, in the early stages of this podcast a couple months ago, and he said, you know, you see a lot of athletes and people doing the digital divide, the education thing, because it's important, it's needed, you know, but the difficult part of some of the things that you with the Players Coalition are trying to do is also the judicial and police reform. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, because you're facing, you know, the, the police unions and you're facing laws and you're facing systems that are inherent, that are much older than much older than broadband and Internet. Um, we could change gears to that and what you're doing. I mean, how difficult is it to try to make headway in that realm as well on, on top of all of the other things that the Players Coalition is doing? Man, that's that's such a it's a loaded question. First and foremost, um, <laughs> that's what we do here. That's what we do here, Kelvin. Oh, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But man, when you think about the the systematic elements, the behavior, the psychology uh, of some of those issues, you're forcing people to grapple with one history, which you know a lot of people don't want to grapple with history. And I try to I try to bring things in from a very historical context and a historical lens to say, hey, this is how it used to be. Do we want to go and talk about Bull Connor down in the South during the Jim Crow era? Like, let's 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 talk about it if we're going to talk about it. So, you know, let's talk about the historical events that are factual. This is how people treated Black people when they policed them. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how the, the, the relationship between um, you know, police and, and communities have been. When you think about stop and frisk in, in, in New York, let's let's talk about some of the issues that were real and relevant. And if you're not willing to grapple with some of those hardcore issues, it's hard to actually get somebody to come to the table and say, "Hey, there are some issues here." Um, I think about currently what's going on. You know, here in Phoenix, Arizona, we've had issues, and I hate watching the news, man. But we've had issues here where, like, the police department is actually getting caught in a lie. And then it's being reported by the news. And then now they're backtracking. And it's like, how do you expect people to trust the government, trust the police, trust the unions, trust the DA, when literally you, you have to have an unbiased opinion to come in and, 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 and show that you were wrong about how you prosecuted a man? And again, that's it wasn't a black man. It, it was a it was a, a colored gentleman that was said to have pushed the police during a, a silent, nonviolent protest. So, you know, it, it's these it's these issues that continue to come up. It's these elements of distrust that continue to come up. And it's guys across the league that have continued to work on those issues. And, you know, it's rough. It's hard, it, especially being a, ba- a black athlete talking about some of the issues that are, that are going on in our society. Um, it's something that, for one, we can never get tired of. It's one that we can never forget because at the end of the day, we still black riding around in the city right now, you know. Um, it could easily be one of us that have couldn't that, that could have got shot. Um, it's, it's 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 that easy. And when you have that particular mindset as you go through some of the issues and some of the circumstances and some of the policy changes that we're trying to to, to work towards, you realize that the fight is far from over. Uh, and we're just now beginning. But I I must say that you have to be willing, and these unions, the DAs, the prosecutors, what have you, uh, FBI, CIA, any agency that that's dealing with. The government, you have to be willing to grapple with these issues. And again, I go back to historical context. Again, watching just the FBI series, watching Judas this weekend, you realize that this is not something that just started. It's been it's going on for some time. So, you know, when you have when you think about those issues and you think about how some of these stories have been brought to light, man, you just have a different perspective. And one, it makes you for me, it makes me want to fight harder. And I can talk about the guys across the board, you know, with Players Coalition, all it does is wants to make us, you know, wants to inspire us to do even more and continue to, 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 to move on. Yeah, until you can recognize the history of it, the root of it, I don't know that we can ever get to a place where it gets better. Right. You know, I think about the video today, this morning I wake up and see in Plano, Texas, of the 18 year old black who's walking home from Walmart in, you know, a t-shirt and you know, the temperatures down there where it's, it, it's, it's mm-hmm. sub freezing and he's simply walking home and the police come and 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 start questioning him and he tells them i'm just walking home and that's not good enough you know and so now the female officer 
touches him and he says, ma'am, I don't want to put my hand on a female. Please don't touch me. And what do they do? They put their hands on him and now you got an issue. So when I heard him say that to her, to me, that said, number one, this is a young man who's been raised right. He's respectful. Mm -hmm. He is saying to her, please don't put your hands on me. I don't want to touch a female. But then they exacerbate the situation. Yeah. And so people say, why wouldn't he just stop and talk to the police? He is telling the police, my home is here. I'm just walking home and I'm in the middle of the street because the sidewalks are iced oh, over. So anyone who knows who has walked in snow, snowy conditions knows that it's easier to walk in the middle of the street when the tire where the tire tracks are than it is to try and walk on the snow and the ice. So those situations, again, to me, that goes back to the whole trust issue that you were talking about and that historical element of it. Black folk know the history and therefore there is a suspicion or a distrust with police. And to me, police then have to understand that. And Kelvin, you with the Players Coalition, I'm sure know this, there is not uniform police tracing training across the country. No. It is different in every state. Every state. And in some local governments. Man, so you know, you, I'm, I'm from Texas, man. You know, I know it's different down there. Believe exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah. So if you can't have uniform training, it's like, how do, again, how do we get to the core of this, of, of correcting it? Yeah. You know, something as simple as that. Um, I fell for that young man. Now here's an 18 year old kid who's walking home from work who has to spend the night in jail. And even my wife said to me, did his parents even know where he was? Right. I, I don't I don't have that answer. But it's just infuriating. You know, some of these things that are going on. So, again, I keep coming back to this. That's why I applaud you and members of the Player Coalition and others who are out there fighting that fight to try and make positive change. And the thing is, man, we're most concerned with the work. At the end of the day, man, that's that's one thing I'm most proud of, you know, being a task force member and, and, and being a, a supporter and an advocate is, is is with the Players Coalition. It's about the work. It's about the work and it's about the people. Um, and as long as it's about that, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for fighting for the issues. And we're doing it together. When you got a collection of guys, it's, it's more than just NFL guys. It's more than just basketball guys. It's become lacrosse and soccer and, and, and different sports all across the, the, the globe that want to find a way to make it better for people and we want to do it together. And in and, and, and this day and time, that's just not something you hear a lot about and, and not something that you hear as collaborative. Uh, it's not a it's not a collaborative nature. It's just not something that our people want to do enough. And I'm just glad that we're able to do that on a consistent basis. Kevin, what have you been most pleased with in terms of your work with the coalition in terms of, of tangible change that you've made? You know, I can think about um, some of the things that were that were that were done up in uh, Massachusetts with the McCordy twins, how they were able to bring down the age of of you know some of the things that were going on in juvenile. I think about the police reform, uh, community reform that um, uh, Anquan has done down in uh, down in Florida. Uh, I think about some of the 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 tactical town halls that we've had in, in different states around some of the elected officials uh, that were happening. We don't say this is the official that needs to be elected. We don't say this is the person that we need to vote for. All we want to do is have a conversation and let the people make the decision that's best for them. So I think for us, I think what I've felt, and I'm not going to say that there's one accomplishment that that out um, that outperforms another one, but I think the fact that we've brought issues to the table and we've made sure that those issues are talked about, and then if there are ways for us to actually have an action item and to be able to work towards something, I'm super appreciative uh, appreciative of that. You know, for me, I spent a lot of time on the education side. That's why I've spent uh, my entire career uh, and being able to have conversations with with people, you know, within the last administration and now with the new administration about some of these issues. Um, for me, that's been super accomplishing to be able to have a conversation with the, the former chairman of the FCC, you know, during the height of COVID, talking about these very issues and making sure that people have access to, to you know, to, to watch, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, broadband, hotspots, et cetera. Those things have been important, but it's hard to just point to one thing and say, hey, this one thing is is what I'm most you know most most happy to accomplish because it's been a collection of things and it's been this continuation of bringing other sports, other folks um, to the table and making sure that we have you know uh, a way in which we can you know provide this voice for, for for people who are marginalized. So it's hard to say that there's just one thing, man, um, and just one accomplishment because it's it's an evolution that's continuing to to, to grow. 
speaking to that, what's interesting to me is that back when the Players Coalition was first formed, you guys to some degree were out on an island. Very much so. There was sti- yeah, there was still that division even among players about mm-hmm. how serious are you guys about doing the work. I wonder now in the summer of 2020, in this age of now, people like to say wokeness, how did the perception of the Players Coalition and, 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 and folks, outsiders, how did it change in terms of how they viewed you all and the work that you were doing? And how did they want to get involved at that point? You know, I think, you know, on, on the football side of things, we always talk about the eye in the sky don't lie, right? And the proof is in the pudding. And I think if you look at the track record of what Players Coalition has done with the resources we've gotten from not only the NFL, but other um, entities across the, the across the globe, we've executed on what we said we were going to execute on. And you think about a winning team, a winning team is, is, is a team that's willing to execute, you know, day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out. And I can say with the Players Coalition, we have continued to execute on exactly what we said we were going to do. We've been super transparent, which I, I, I love because I think transparency um, provides a level of trust, not only for those within the organization, but those with, you know, outside of the organization. And then I think that we've won people over just doing the work. It's not, you know, it's not a publicity stunt. It's not, you know, you know, pictures here. It's not galas here. No, it's about doing the work. And when you do the work, real people know what real work is. Real people like yourselves know what real work is. Y'all been covering the NFL and athletes for decades upon decades. Y'all know what's real and y'all know what's not. And when we can put that information on the Internet and we can send this information over to you all directly and it's free for everybody to see and everybody to check us on every single dime that we've gotten, every single dime we've deployed, you know exactly where our money is. And we're not only talking to talk, but we're walking the walk. And I can say that that's, for me, what's most important. And that's changed the narrative because, you know, at one point in time, we were sellouts. You know, right. uh, we, we were the scapegoats. We, we took NFL money and we ran. And, you know, we, go, you know, we, we got hush money. I don't I don't I can't say that any person that was involved what was that 2018 2017 can say that this was hush money. Um, and again, it's not that we're discrediting anybody else that's done anything within this landscape. We're all about being collaborative. But what we set out to do, we've done and we've executed on exactly what we set out to do. We laid a plan out and we went and executed. And for me, that's that's all that I feel you need to do. And I think in, in, a, in a business where it's performance-based, you all talk about it all the time, performance-based business, and we know how. We, that's a whole other conversation for another day regarding coaches and, and, and GMs within the National Football League. But we know it's a performance-based business. And as, as, as players, when we put this thing together, we knew we had to be data-driven, performance-based driven. We had to be results-driven. And we've done that. Um, and I, I can't speak to that. Just the proof was in the pudding, man. Check the track record. Well, Calvin, you gave us a great jumping off point because Jim and I have been talking about something all season long and talking about it's about the work, Mm -hmm. right? And so Jim and I had all started like this when the NFL said we're going to play Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Black National Anthem. Thank you. That's our response. Folks who didn't see it, Calvin threw his head back. because we (laughs) We all thought that was grandstanding, right? Like nobody asked for that, but we are asked for helping to fix a digital divide and judicial reform yeah. and civic reform and things like that. So just, I mean, again, from the uh, spokesman for the players coalition, the hashtags, the, the, the symbols on the field, the, you know, again, some things again, that, that were publicly symbolic, Yeah. but was that the real work? You know, is that something that could be as impactful as, as you guys taking the time you're doing to meet with legislators and the things that you do? You know, I'm not going to talk about what they did. Um, I'm going to talk about what we did. And, and we stayed the course and did the work, you know, in spite of the different hashtags, the different slogans, the, you know, I, I think it was needed. You know, they did what they needed to do to appease, I guess, their moral compass in a way, you know. Um, but we stayed the course and did the work that we were that we're called to do. And that's the work that, that we've been doing. Um, around police and community relations, criminal justice reform, uh, education and economic mobility. We, we've continued to, to work 
within those lanes, no matter what, no matter if we plan lift every voice, no matter if we're, you know, talking about say your name, which I think is super important. Um, but we've continued to do the work. Um, and I think, you know, I'm going to take this time to say it, you know, if, if they were really about it, we will find a way to make sure that when coaches and GMs and presidents come up for opportunities to, to, to be able to be influential within organizations, we make sure that that's done. Um, and if I need to get more granular and say exactly what I need to say, we need to make sure that black coaches get hired and GMs, black GMs get hired and black presidents get hired. As simple as that, because uh, you can't have a coach go from being a tight ends coach to a head coach. I don't know. We can just jump the line like that. But that ain't what this podcast is about. But that's where you can actually. Oh, it is. It is. Most- we can go there. <laughs> <laughs> we can always go there, Kelvin. <laughs> always, <laughs> always. You know, it's always the right time to address the wrong thing. So, um yeah, no. So if you want to take it there, we can go there. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> it's, it's just I mean, it's just hard watching, man. You know, I mean, I think Steve said this a minute ago. We we started, you know, it's a hundred yard dash, and you get a, uh, you know, I would say at this point, I mean, it's like a freaking seventy yard head start. You know, um, it's like the, the 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 goal keeps keeps moving, um, and it's I mean, it's just it's just hard watching. You know, I was. I was super happy. I mean, just elated to see Ty Bowles, you know, win his, his win that Super Bowl, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I was I was with him in New York, um, and I saw what went on in that organization. Um, and to see him go and thrive in spite of how he was treated in that organization, um, for me, again, he just did the work. He did the work. He put the time in. He had the staff that he needed to hire, and he went to go and he went and executed. So to see him do it in that fashion. It was it was it was magical to watch it, man. To to be able to to show the world what they missed out on, it, it's, it's a it's a beautiful thing. You know, I always say this, Kelvin. You know, people say, well, they should owners should be able to hire the the most qualified. And I say, you're absolutely right. I agree with you. Hire the most qualified. And if we're trying to do this objectively, then fine. Let's do blind resumes. Then let's put them up on a board with no name on it, and let's see whose resume shows that someone is truly qualified. I'm willing to wager right now, and I'm not a betting man, but I'm willing to wager right now that if I were to put up a blind resume of a Jim Caldwell, of an Eric Bieniemy, of a Pep Hamilton versus a Nick Sirianni or a Dan Campbell or someone else, objectively speaking, I don't see any way you can, you can, you can select that other group. I'm just being honest about it. Man, I, I would put another name in there, Brandon Hunt. You know, yeah, no, I, yeah, right. Right. exactly. Absolutely. Put 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 his name up versus any other candidate that was hired for the GM job. Simple as that. Don't like know where school did he come from, who was his daddy, who did his daddy used to scout for. None of that. Just put the names up there. Not even names. Just like you said, just put the the resumes up there. What they've done in the role that they've been in what the team that they've been on have done while they were there in that particular role. And again, let the, let, let the, let the track record speak for itself. You know, as players, we, we, we're, we're literally judged by what is on film. That's it. It don't matter how you felt. It don't matter if your mom died, if your dad died, you know, you had somebody that died from COVID that was close to you. If your wife had a miscarriage, none of this stuff matters on Sunday when they put that film on, they don't care. They don't want to care. Like, that's just the nature of our business. So why is it that, you know, when we get behind closed doors, now it's like, man, who is your daddy? And, and where did you come from? What school did you go to? And, you know, which back over here did you scratch? And which back over here did you scratch? Man, just get, get away from all that. Like, just let it be objective and let the chips fall where they fall. As simple as that. Let the chips fall where they fall based on exactly what their track record and what they put on film says. Simple as that. And it's just, again, it's, 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 it's hard seeing it as a player. And I played for two black coaches, man. I played I play for Mike Tomlin. I played for Todd Bowles. I played for some Caucasian coaches. I've, 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 I've had offensive line coaches that have been white, blue, green the whole nine. I see it. And to see it and to see, you know, people passed over so many times. I mean, that's why I was so elated to see Adrian Clem get the job in Pittsburgh, man. You know, that doesn't happen too often. It just doesn't. 
you know, I, it, it was a coach that that was that was an intern. I can't even think of his name. His name um, he was uh, uh, he came out of Grambling. Um, was been an assistant coach in in uh, in New York. He's been an assistant coach in Chicago, and still ain't got a call. Hmm. You know, so it's meant to to see Clem get that job. Man, was was a step forward. Is it the the is it the the end all be all? Not at all. Jason Wright, you know, get, getting the, the 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 head job on the business side of the house there in Washington. It's a great step forward. But I mean, I know it's a whole a whole crew of folks that can go and do that role at a number of organizations across the National Football League. Man, you can be on my soapbox. We're not supposed to be talking about all this day. We're supposed to be talking about the digital divide. No, no, there, there, there's there's no ground there's no ground rules here, Kelvin. This is the Huddle Flow <laughs> podcast, bro. We flow. Flow is flow is the second part of this. It's in the title. So this is what we do. <laughs> part of the digital divide divide is is providing educating people. You need the digital divide to educate people. So you are educating people right now. So it all Again, ties man, I, in. I just, I just try to use the historical lens, man, when I'm thinking about it and when I'm trying to educate. Because if you look at history and look at the historical narratives that have continued to play our our, our league, I mean, you got rid of Jim Caldwell in New York, I mean, in, uh, in, in Detroit, after he went nine and seven multiple times and went to the playoffs. And have they even had a shot at the playoffs since then? No, but they're drafting high every year. <laughs> that, that's, that's for me. That, that's, again, just looking at uh, the track record of, of some of these folks, it's just, it's just mind-blowing. It's just mind-blowing. I mean, the thing is, I can say this stuff, man, is, is you know, I'm, 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 you know, when you get – you get to, to multiple years in the league, man, you, you kind of just let your mouth just go where it want to go because you, you really don't care what anybody got to say, how you're going to be treated. Because um, you know what you have to say is right. And it'd be different if I was lying, you know, about Ty Bowles. Or exactly. Or Adrian right. Kim. I'm not lying. I mean, just, just look at look look at what the track record says. I mean, people try to go at Tomlin every year. Well, he need to – the dude been coaching for over a decade. I mean, he ain't missed 15, the playoffs. 15 a years. 15 years and it's never had a losing record. Yep. They were, hey, they were undefeated. They lose two games in a row, and people were like, oh, Tomlin's losing it. He ain't got. They were undefeated. They were 11 0. (laughs) We we have coaches that, you know, go have losing seasons for two straight years, and they still got a job. And we we need to see if they can make it. We can see if they can make it work now. Yeah. Right. We We see the Adam Gases of the world. Get fired in one place and within hours have a job someplace else. So, come on, Matt. We being real about all of this. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm and he, and he ain't one. the only one. He I'm too close, close. <laughs> too close to that one. Hey, but I mean, I mean, here, here's the, here's the thing too, though. From where, where Jim and I sit, right? We now have an opportunity to give voices to you and the others, and where we can talk about this. This is this is what we are trying to do in, in our realm, because there aren't too many mediums broadcast print whatever where, where this can happen right. and we see how these coaches certain coaches take care of other people in the media to get those certain stories out and certain hey man this is all 100 right here yeah you know jim, jim and i are not bought and sold we we and we give we give everyone on who come on our show every opportunity to say their piece well Kevin, let's go in a different direction this is kind of an on-field direction to some degree a bigger picture right you're a free agent we're, we're hearing all this talk about free agency with the salary cap coming down. We're going to see a lot of veteran players getting cut. We've seen guys at like K1 Short and J.J. Watt, uh, you know, some, some players already getting cut as teams are trying to get under the cap. What about the uneasiness of being a free agent? Or, or, or is it uneasy in, in these types of scenarios where, again, owners are going to use excuses to trim salaries because the overall cap is coming down? Well, first, I need to address the elephant in the room. If you're the right color, you can get released. Um very easily, you know, that's what happened in Houston because it's a, a guy that's on that squad that's trying to get traded out of that same place and he can't get traded. So sorry to be on my soapbox. Y'all allowed the opportunity for me to do that. So I did that already. Uh, <laughs> but wait, but wait, 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 wait. No, yeah, I, I, I can't wait. Understand, but I, I, I got to stop you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Because number one, you don't let franchise quarterbacks, 25-year-old franchise quarterbacks walk out the building. And and I, you know I'm there with you, my brother. Well, but you should. Deshaun you should Watson allow, versus Carson Wentz. You should allow him to at least if he if if he if he's your if he's your guy. Why aren't you doing everything to make sure that your guy's taken care of? Just like you've done for every other quarterback in the National Football League. 
I'm not disagreeing with that at all. Yeah, no, no not disagreement with that. I'm I'm and just so, saying there's no way I'm letting I agree. Walk out that door. Business wise, yeah. yes, I agree. Without question. Yeah. Without question. Yeah. So you know, the, I I agree with you on that point. Uh, but to your your question, Steve, it's the, the thing is, is I've been down this road a number of times already. Um, this is my fourth time being a free agent. But not but but not with a diminishing salary cap, not with these circumstances it's, where excuses that, can be true. built in. That's true, but I would say even last year being a free agent was even harder than this year because we had no idea if we was going to even have a football season. So to be a free agent, not knowing that you're going to have a football season is, you know, at least this year we know we're going to have – it's going to be a season. We just know the salary cap is decreased by, um, you know, a, a, a couple million. Um, but I would say the, 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 uneasy, the, the uneasiness is in the very fact that, yes, I am an older player. Um, <clears throat> I understand that the body of work uh, is what it is, but at the same time, you can go and get uh, a 22 year old to 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 play. Um, you know, 16, 17. It was going to be 17 games now. So, you know, there are a, a lot of questions that uh, continue to go through my mind. But I think the best way that I've been able to handle is is control what I can control, and that sounds very cliche, but that's really what what my focus is: is controlling what I can control. Um, and understanding the, the dynamics of, of the game and understanding the dynamics of the business. Uh, and if you realize and, and want to understand the dynamics of the business, you find ways to put yourself in a position um, to, to play the game the way that you need to play it for you to have the desired outcome for, for you and your family. You know, Kelvin, we heard J.C. Treader, president of the NFLPA, say late in the season that what this season, what last season, the COVID season, had taught him is that all of that on-field work in the off-season is not necessary. And I wonder from your standpoint, I know you're a veteran, so you're probably in favor of less work on the field in the off-season. So I'm setting it up on a tee for you. But what are your thoughts about some of the changes that things that were done during the COVID off-season that can be moved forward and should have an impact on, on how teams train? You know, I think JC first and foremost hit the nail on the head. They're, we're the only sport that has this type of offseason set up, and we're the most brutal, most violent sport on the planet, you know. So to, to be able to limit um, some of the exposure, even though it's not as violent in the, the offseason, to be able to limit some of that exposure is, is, is worth it at this point. I think one of the great things that came out of this particular um, season was the ramp-up period during training camp. So I'm I'm of the the you know of the of the crowd that says hey once the season is over don't bring us back until like late July or like you know early July right after July 4th so we have that ramp up here that ramps us right into training camp right into the season and we go and do what we need to do because that's all you're doing in uh, April you're pretty much ramping us up to ramp us back down to ramp us back up to ramp us back down to then go into training camp. Why not just have the whole ramp up period all in one time? Like that's what happened this year. Literally, we came in mid July. We ramped up on field for a week, week and a half. We ramped up before we put the the, the, the pads on, so it was like an OTA type of field first, and then you know, kind of this version of a of a of a mini camp that happened, and then you had training camp, and then you had the season, and you know, no preseason was a part of it. So that's a conversation that needs to be had, but. I think that the, the the opportunity to be able to have that ramp up all at one time is something that I think we should be able to point to and say, hey, this is something that was productive for us. Is this something that we can keep moving forward? Because the thing is, is if here's the thing. If you say that we're men, we're pros, allow us to be treated like men and pros. You don't need to be babysitting us in April, May, and mid-June. If we're pros, allow us to be pros. And for me, I think that's something that you know, we, we can have moving forward, and you know, whether we do it or not, that's still up for question. I mean, we got rep means, and I know they got owners over the next couple of weeks. So, did y'all lose me again? I, we got you. You are in and out, but we, we got, got you. you. Got you. Well, we, let me let me give you real, real quick the two devil's advocate things I hear. Number one, you hear coaches say. It's less about the veterans than it is the young players. We need to we need to break them in. They need the training. And the other thing you'll hear from young players, whether it's rookies, undrafted, or whatever, is 
from a financial standpoint, it benefits them to be able to be in the building, to use all the facilities, the resources, all those sorts of things. Are those two valid in your mind? The first one I don't think is valid because you had a rookie that went and broke the rookie receiving record, broke, I think it's Calvin Johnson's record, if I'm not mistaken, in Minnesota, right? Right. That was a rookie that broke that record, right? I yeah, I don't know if I don't know if he broke the rookie record, but no question he was outstanding. I know he broke the franchise record. Right. right? Randy Moss's well, franchise record. Well, so for me, it's, it's hard to say that um, young players are not willing and capable to come in and still go and perform. You still, I mean, you had a rookie quarterbacks that came in and performed. You had rookie receivers that came in and performed. You had the right tackle for the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who ended up playing in the Super Bowl and starting the Super Bowl was a rookie. So I think it's hard, it's hard to say that, you know, young players didn't have an opportunity to, to be prepared and, and ready. You know, I'm not saying that we need to cut out the opportunity to be able to have the ability to go into the to the building during the offseason. I've been stopping by the building a couple of times during the offseason, you know, getting COVID tests, checking in, making sure that, you know, things with my body are right. So I don't think that you're that, you know, we're saying that you can't have an offseason. I think that you can have an offseason. I just don't think that we need the the OTA type of feel because, I mean, all it does is turn into, you know, either fights that don't need to happen or it turns into, you know, just this this soft vacation that, you know, we're, we're working through. So, um, I mean, I just think that there's, there are ways to, 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 to be able to slice it and ways to be able to get it done. Gotcha. And of course, Kelvin, the, 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 the learning, the system work happens online digital digitally where we need to have you know the the good wi-fi services and whatnot so you know on that note as we button this up i mean what about the work you're doing with with intuit um to help the digital divide and, and things like that you know the the work with intuit has been organic it's been real and it's been authentic you know what they've done is they've been able to to help 20 under this uh undeserved um and underserved um, communities across the country. Uh, they set up the, the Intuit Prosperity Hub, where they've been able to talk about uh, being able to help young people gain those 21st century skills. Um, we talked about this early on in the podcast, but making sure that everybody within the ecosystem is it, the students, the teachers, the parents, everybody plays a role in this particular, um, you know, situation that we got going on with the digital divide. And I would, I, I, have to, I would be remiss to say that Intuit has done a phenomenal job of of putting their money where their mouth is. Um, and I've had the ability to work with them over the past couple of months and have really just been impressed by how they've continued to not only put the money where their mouth is, but they've actually been on the groundwork working with um, districts, uh, people at the state and local level, um, and just decided to continue working with them. Well, and we're, we're happy for into it because they continue to sponsor the Huddle and Flow podcast, which this week was highlighted by Kelvin Beach. And Kelvin, Jim and I just, Mad love for the work you're doing, the Players Coalition. For you speaking your truth, my brother. <laughs> Y'all started it. We did. <laughs> we got, we're going to try and finish it, too. I know. I know. That's why, that's why I love you guys, man. So, so thankful for y'all having me on this evening. Steve, in my time covering the Players Coalition, I often hear people say, what are the players doing? What impact are they having? And Kelvin Beecham is one of those guys who, to me, personifies the Player Coalition. Someone who is not looking for headlines, someone who might not be a big name, but they are out there doing the work, the work that he talked about. It's not about any of that other stuff. It's simply about trying to make a difference in these communities. And I couldn't respect him more for that. And I think that, unfortunately, I hate it when people say, you know, what are they doing? What impact are they having? You know, if you really did your homework and you studied it, you'd know fairly quickly that there are a number of players who might not be household names, but who are making a tremendous difference in households across this country. Yeah, and as Kelvin said, it's about the work. It's not about the splash. It's not about this. It's, a, it's about the work. Well, Jim, I'm going to change gears a little bit uh, because, you know, we – we haven't talked about HBCU sports in a minute, but now HBCU football is back in, in the spring. And we saw over the weekend, Deion Sanders, our old colleague, the Hall of Fame cornerback, now the head coach at Jackson State University, they get off to a 53-0 to debut victory over Edward Waters College. 
But unfortunately, that wasn't the story post game. Dion shows up and immediately says, I'm happy for the win, but I'm angry because somebody broke into the coach's locker room, stole some of my merchandise out of a private bag that I had there. School comes out and issues a statement, says, no, that was just misplaced. Nothing was stolen. Dion comes back and says publicly on Twitter, oh, no, that's a lie if anyone's saying my stuff was not stolen. So now we've got the narrative of instead of these kids and in, in the coaching staff celebrating this victory of one of the few black college games that we've seen uh, because COVID has postponed everything, now we're talking about what's happening at Jackson State, an incredibly proud and important program to HBCU sports. And – you know, this this is a there's a lot of lot of feelings I I have over this gym, but I kind of want to get your thoughts on this, kind of seeing it from afar, and from the information that you know that's been put out there about this whole situation. Yeah, my my first feeling, Steve, was that this is something that should have been handled internally. I didn't feel like after a game, and knowing that you were going to have national media coverage that this is what you wanted to put out. This is what you wanted to give to the world, you know, in terms of uh, Dion taking over the Jackson State program. The other thing that I will say to you, to me, what made me uncomfortable is reading the story about the game, reading the stories about um, just that entire day. I felt that the focus was so much on Dion Sanders and not on Jackson State. And that, that disturbed me a little bit. Look, I understand that Dion is the show and him being there is bringing attention to HBCUs and HBCU football that it might not otherwise have. I get that. But maybe it's just me and that old man, you know, as I get older and I become my grandfather or my father, where I'm like, it's not about you. It's about that program, as you say, that proud program. And to all of a sudden, like when I heard the uniforms that they wore were red, I'm like, that's just not Jackson State's colors. There's a, there's, a, there's a tradition behind that blue and white that Jackson State wears. I have not heard what the reason was for the red, but they wore red. And then all the coaches wore the blue, but Dion wore red. And I'm thinking, okay, I know that sometimes a coordinator will wear a color so that the players on the field can spot them more easily. Is that what was happening here? I'm not so certain. And then to come into the post-game interview with your own personal letterman's jacket, so to speak, that said more about, that spoke more to you than it did to the university, that made me uncomfortable. So look, I'm saying all this and I, I'm sure I'll be called a hater and this, that, and the other, but I believe in the, in the traditions, I believe in the program, and I believe that no one is bigger than the program. And unfortunately, at this moment, I feel like everything is about Dion and not about Jackson State football. Well, I mean, like you said, though, I mean, I think initially it is going to be about Dion because it's Dion, right? And he's going to coach. He's a former player going to coach a historically black college. We 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 have yeah, but, seen. but yeah, but here's where I'm gonna push back on that, Steve. The attention is going to come to Dion regardless. Regardless, if he's if he's wearing a Jackson State. Letterman's jacket, that attention is still going to be there. But when that that Letterman's jacket says DS and Prime, Coach Prime, and all of these things, now it appears that you're putting the focus on you. So that's why I say he could show up in just a, a blue sweatsuit with nothing on it, and the attention is going to be there. So why all the other things? Right. Well, I mean that that's not now is where it's about to be, get interesting, Jim, because they're going to get into their into their conference schedule. I mean, they've got Mississippi Valley, Grambling, Alabama, Alabama State, Prairie View. You know, all of these schools coming up. So is, is this attention going to continue to stay on him? And what's to me the real intriguing part about this, right? So this is the second time there are headlines about Dion getting robbed. Remember, somebody stole his boombox out of his vehicle a couple weeks ago. So now the community of Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson State University, they're in an odd spot. Like, okay, we, we invited Dion in. We love the celebrity. We love the attention. But now the attention is going on the negativity of, of, of him being robbed a couple times. The attention is going on the university or someone from the university being called a liar for trying to say his stuff was misplaced and not stolen. So where is this relationship going? 
because Dion has gone out and recruited a bunch of really talented kids who are on the on the books to come in next year. Is he going to be around that long? Because right now, after one game, a a, a just convincing fifty three to nothing victory, this seems like it's headed in a direction where they're not you know he's not going to be there for a while. I mean, and I know Dion from working with him here at the network, and, and I just think he's he's all the way authentic. And I think if he's going to commit, he's going to commit. But the fact now that the city of Jackson, his community that's robbed their head coach twice, there's been criminal activity about his property twice, and then the university being called liars like, yo, <laughs> we're just getting started here. We just kicked off our first game, and this is where we are? When you say he's going to commit, he'll commit, I would ask you, what is he committing to? That And that's what we don't know. Yeah, that's really what we do. Is he going to commit to these kids who are who – are, you know, he got people transferring. I mean, didn't his son transfer from Florida, from FIU? Yeah. Or, or one See, of those I'm schools? Not, yeah, I, I guess I'm not going to get that far down the road because I don't know. And I, I don't, I've don't. i not spoken to Dion. I don't know what his objective was, overall objective in terms of taking this job, if he views it simply as a stepping stone or a one and done or whatever. I have no idea. So I don't want to speak on the man's character from that standpoint. All I'm speaking to is, and I'm acknowledging it up front. This is, we are different personalities. I don't like the attention the way he does. So I'm putting that out there. And, and that's why I'm saying some of what I'm saying. It makes me uncomfortable right. that I see more focus on him and him attempting to bring more focus to him than I do on the program itself. Like that press conference, I didn't hear anything about what one of how the players performed in terms of individually or collectively as a unit. I didn't hear anything about that. I don't even know who their players are at this point. Because all all I saw in the stories that I read out of that was boy, Deion Sanders put on a heck of a press conference going off about some of his stuff being stolen. And to me, that's unfortunate. Because it, at the end of the day, in my mind at least, it should still be about these young men. And here's where I am with you on that, and I'm, and I'm glad you said that. As us being HBCU grads, as me being very involved with the Black College Football Hall of Fame, right, listen to some of the great coaches who've come through Jackson State. John Merritt, W.C. Gordon. These are legends. These are guys who are right there with Jake Gaither and Eddie Robinson. These are legends, Right, who put young men in the NFL, who put young men into the workforce and society who have done great things, who've touched a lot of lives being football coaches. Most people don't know their names. Now, they weren't NFL Hall of Fame players, but they were about their guys. right? And some of those guys included Harold Jackson, one of the best wide receivers of his era, Lem Barney, Robert Brazil, Walter Payton, Coy Bacon, Jackie Slater, right? These, these are some of the greatest guys to ever play in the NFL. Four Hall of Famers, Pro Football Hall of Famers in that list. All the other guys I mentioned are Black College Football Hall of Famers, and there are others. That's what it's about. It is legacy. It is history. And, yeah, right now this thing going on is, is off to a real funky start. Hopefully all of this now – Dion kind of gets again when I see guys like John Merritt, W.C. Gordon. These are legends, man. You're sitting in their in their chair, coaching on their field. I mean, this is this is where you want to be. So hopefully they can get through this. This is a bad window, and we can push on to some more great things again to bring HBCU athletics back to the forefront. Jim, before we get out of here, I want to let people know that you have a great story coming out. Speaking of this on. Uh, black quarterbacks in the NFL. Oh, it, if you it, could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Steve, it just goes back to a conversation you and I had with Doug Williams before week two, where he he said to us before we came on the podcast, hey, do you guys realize, you know, we've got four games where the starting quarterbacks um, facing off are all black. And I hadn't thought about it. And there was no discussion about it anywhere. And it just got me to thinking, is that a sign that maybe we've moved past race in the evaluation process of quarterbacks? And so I just decided to ask people from a historical standpoint, 
um, if they feel that way. So I spoke to Warren Moon, Doug Williams, Shaq Harris, um, Tony Dungy, Byron Leftwich, um, Jimmy Ray, and just to get their thoughts. And it was sort of a mixed bag. You know, some said they believe it's no longer a factor. Others say they still believe it's a factor. And we know that this year, I believe two of the top four prospects at the quarterback position are black in this upcoming draft. And so it seems kind of timely just in terms of, of what they think about it. And lastly, I'll leave you on this. You know, you can talk, some might say, well, what do the personnel people think? And the reality is this is one of those times, as you know, as a journalist, where you're never going to get truly an honest answer for the most no. part. Because it's a no-win situation for personnel people. If they say that race is no longer a factor, then everyone says, yeah, right, sure, that's what you're supposed to say. If they say race is still a factor in the equation, then they have people who are going to come down on them, particularly I'm talking about above them, at the league and the organization saying, what are you doing saying that? Um, that's not the image, that's not the message we want out there, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a no win for the personnel people who have to address it. And that's why I went to people who have either played blacks, who have either played the position or have been impacted by this in some way. And um, I tell you this, so Steve, and, and then we can get out on this. The one fascinating stat in the whole story to me is like everyone, not everyone, but many people point to the 1999 draft as being sort of what they believe sort of the flashpoint, the turning point in how black quarterbacks um, were viewed. And if you remember that year, there were three um, quarterbacks who were black who were drafted among the first 11 picks and including two of the first three with Donovan McNabb, Achilles Smith and Dante Culpepper. Well, what's interesting to me is if that's the flashpoint and that's progress, it wasn't until 2017, 18 years later that we had a draft in which multiple black quarterbacks were taken in the first round. That's crazy. So, I know. That's what I'm saying to you. So was it really progress? Was that really a flashpoint in terms of the beginning? I'm saying to you, 18 years before we had another first round in which multiple quarterbacks who were black were drafted, and that was Patrick Mahomes and, and Deshaun Watson. So... Make of it what you will, but that that's just that's sort of the 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 impetus for the story. Well, I'm sure it's gonna be it a, great a huddle and flow podcast. It's it a huddle flow podcast, podcast baby. Hey, but I'm sure it's a great story because everything you do is on point, JT. Well, on that note, my I'm brother, sure. why don't you take us home, my man? Yeah, we we thank you for subscribing. We thank you for listening. We thank you for leaving us your comments about what you'd like to uh, hear from us, who you'd like to hear from, etc. Please continue to do that. That way we can continue to give you more of what you're funking for. That's right. Maybe the off season, but it's never the off season for the Huddle and Flow podcast. All right. From my man, Jim Trotter, our producer, Thomas Warren, and the ones and twos. I am Steve White. Remember, we are brought to you by Intuit, the problem makers of TurboTax, Mint, and QuickBooks. This is the Huddle and Flow podcast, and we are out. Oh, 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 oh,